test testing man so yeah this is the bookstore <laughs> get this thing away from my uh, voice and um, what a mess it is <laughs> yeah um An interesting story. Here's my my third sister. No, my second sister. My first eldest sister was Donna, and the next one after her was Susan. And uh, yeah, 1966. Something I remember. I want to say it, it is. 1966, and I'm pretty sure I have, it was 65 and 66, my sister was taking care of her baby, she uh, she had given birth, and um, her baby was uh, severe, severe Down syndrome, she'd had a ectopic pregnancy, and uh, her baby died one year and uh, this is the thing I was in a college class and they said you can't remember anything from 1966 okay here's a gravestone here's here's a church with this tower with the bells it's still there <laughs> over near Panthersville Flat Hill somewhere uh, along there it's uh, my sister's uh, family her, her my, my brother-in-law has his family, the Scott family, many of them are buried there. And her name was Robin Scott, the baby's name. And, um, yeah, when we went to the funeral home, um, or, well, I, I don't know. It was a chapel. I'm not sure if it was a... Yeah, I think it was a funeral home. I really do think... Because... It, it was kind of big, and on the inside, there were families, right? And there was uh, one of these crisscross wood gates to keep toddlers, like, locked in a room. They used to have these things you stretch across and lock in a, and it's like a, a wooden crisscross gate, hardwood, and the kids can't get through it. And they were taking me towards that. And I was I was walking alongside my sister, and I was wearing my little suit and everything. And we were getting close to the to the wood gate, like they were gonna put me in there. And the kids were dancing towards the. There were there were kids in there, and they were dancing, and they were dancing to Yummy, yummy, yummy. I got love in my tummy, and I feel like I'm loving you. All right. Check it. 1966. Was that a hit? Because this probably just hit radio. Quick C or something like that. I can't remember. But um, yeah, we we're going toward the gate, and then there was like, no, we're not gonna take him over there. We're gonna go and t and there was a coffin, and it was open, and there was light. It was dim in the in the room, and uh, I remember. My my sister's sadness was palpable. Um, and life life is like a novel, you know. She ended up she did have two healthy children, but um, because of the violence and and stuff that and disciplinary violence in particular in the home. She was like, nobody will ever beat my kids, right? I, I wore, you know, no, I don't. <laughs> it's a way you can beat children. And it worked. Susan survived. <laughs> uh no, it didn't work. It, it it 
that's fine. Um, okay, so my sister, she had two healthy children, uh, but she never whipped them or anything. They could basically do no wrong. They, you know, people were not, I, I was not allowed, you know, if Todd whined or something like that, I was not allowed to say, man, my sister would just, don't you dare say anything to tear him down or cut him down or, um, I'm trying to get to the bottom of something, you know, I just know now that he's, he's lost a couple of businesses and a lot of people have. I'm ha you know, I'm haunted by, you know, this idea that, uh, you're going to spoil a kid. I don't, uh, it, you know, I, I get, people get after me, you know, child needs a firm hand and all, you know, you said needs a firm hand. You seen that movie in the name of the father beat him. That's I'll straighten him out. <laughs> No. When Giuseppe Conlon meets his son in prison in that movie, it's like, it's, it's always been about everything that I've done wrong. You always follow me when I've done wrong. Even when I won a medal, you followed me about something I did wrong. Did you foul the ball, Jerry? Did you foul the ball? Did you foul the ball? Who cares? We won. He got a medal, right? Uh, for once, you know, the it, it's like he came to a point where this, you know, the story of in the name of the Father. It was it's a true story. He said he came to a point where his words don't mean anything anymore. The discipline doesn't mean anything. The rules don't mean anything. I'm just bad. I'm all, no matter what I do, I'm bad. Right. Uh, <laughs> and he blames his father. He says, you keep following me. Now you're in prison. You happy? <laughs> yeah. So... Yeah, I'm. I'm glad I'm sort of trying to talk talk about this because I got on the phone. My unfortunately, you know, well, one thing I understood more is that whippings when I was young, a little baby in the '60s, '50s, and '60s, you know, it was you know spare the rod and spoil the child. Some people still think that way, you know. But mom, or our, our, our mom, many many years later. She finally, you know, I didn't speak to her for many years because of the, the, the physical, the whippings and the getting slapped around and stuff. And she was finally able, but many years later, I said, you know, we're, you know, you come from your mom, right? You come from your dad. You need to talk because you're, you're kind of the same you know, made up of the same stuff, you know, there's a lot there. So many years later, I, I made, an, uh, I said, what we should do is just talk about new stuff. No, let's just not go back there and make a new relationship from, from tabula rasa, from nothing, right? So I talked to my mom and man, we started to talk five hours, at least once or twice a week. I really, really regret I didn't, I didn't tape it. But about the beating, she said, I finally realized the beatings were good for me. They were bad for the children. And she was able to express that it was like, as a single parent, you know, the odd, the people looking down their nose and, oh, you know, well, she, you know, she go with, you know, 
door-to-door -door salesman? What what kind of woman is she? You know, it's, she's under tremendous pressure, and if her kids gotten into trouble or shenanigans or something like that, uh, she felt yeah she was supposed to whip them. And this yeah, it's common down the south still. To, and you know, mom, she, she her in the countryside in Donaldsonville, the way my mother tells her of her life you know so she, she would have been uh, 10 years old in uh, 1934 35 right marriageable age at, at World War two right and raising a family by the Korean War that's where she was now in the 1930s in Iron City, Georgia, or whatever, was very segregated and very, the men, my mom had nothing but horrible stories to tell about the racism of men, and also my aunt, uh, the racism of white men. Never anything to say about black men. My aunt never had any stories to tell about black men my mom either it's a you know segregated kind of situation but all my aunt's friends or, or the people that she remained close to were black women down in iron city right and my my mom uh always preferred the company of black women now what had happened in their household um when you know in the when my mom was was very young her mother passed away and being it being as how let's see how many kids they had they had vita Wida, my, my mom and her uh older sister and joyce so there were three girls and then there was Luther, Donald, and Julius. So I think at least six under uh, Jimmy, Jimmy Howe. Very little Welsh DNA. That's very interesting. You know, because <laughs> if you look at the history of the British Empire and the relationship of the Welsh and the Irish and stuff like that, and the fact that, that my maternal grandmother's name was Piety Brannan, you know, it, it it doesn't come as a surprise later on. The DNA reveals almost very, very little Welsh DNA uh, in in my uh, branch there, which we're we're pretty certain. Well, I mean, we're going along the mother, right? So my mother, we know it's her. Can't hide that. And we know her maternal uh, mother. Um, and there's no Welsh, but, um, well, one of the things that could happen if you had a name like Mikhail, McCall, right, uh, uh, that, that is actually, of uh, 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 Mikhail or McCall or whatever is, uh, is, uh, 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 Mikhail, right? It's how. It's the etymology, uh, etymologically, or the in terms of the origins of names. This is is uh, 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 the Irish version of the name how. So it's possible that not wanting to be that it was preferable to be Welsh than to be Roman Catholic in the Deep South. So who knows how that Howl name got there. But they were among the earliest settlers. And the DNA said that too. Okay, so what was happening is that uh, my, my mom's a, a little girl and uh, her mom dies and there's six of them there and the, the father, Jamie Howell, my grandfather, is um, he's got to get married again. <laughs> to take care of the household because he's got a it's hard it's subsistence farming down there and like for example they're, they're talking about with the uh with the terrible storms that have happened 
uh, down Donaldsonville Way and Iron City Way. Terrible things that have happened down there um, uh, with climate change and so on. Uh, some of the word that I got was like, it was like being of the frontier days again. We, we've been reduced to such a level that, um, yeah, it's like, it's like when it was frontier. <laughs> Of course, they probably, they have very little memory, probably it was beautifully forested and just unimaginably beautiful back then, and we've wrecked it. <laughs> but, okay, so what happened? Uh, Jimmy Howell, not Welsh <laughs> uh, very much, a little tiny bit of Welsh, uh, but not Howell Welsh. <laughs> but in, anyway, yeah, he got married to Viola, and of course she got... Uh, the thing, th it's a given, you know, I, I, I marry you and you support me for the rest of my life and I get the inheritance. I get your farm and everything. And your, he had a little store that he started <laughs> down there and he married this, uh, uh, I, she just don't look great. You know, like, a, like her intentions are all that good. She doesn't look like it. And mom said it wasn't, <laughs> but, uh, so mom uh, yeah, all of them had to get out. I mean, it's uh, very soon later, uh, uh, J James Howell passed away. Viola got everything. And, uh, yeah, it was time for the girls to get married and the guys to go to World War II. <laughs> and don't come back. Right. And so, yeah, Viola's family got that, that property. And mom always felt like it was, something that should have stayed together instead of uh uh but that's that's the thing of a stepmother you know she's position is pretty powerful here but you can imagine that if uh she came in and she her her aim was just to get the prize she was trying to drive people out as fast as possible so she would be raising hell and 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 whipping and slashing and kicking and biting um and uh my sisters would run away you know to hide and of course during the day uh there was no place to hide except for like these little black black women's houses the black women would be at home making uh, homemaking and their their husbands were sharecropping or day laboring and stuff like that and uh, uh so my mom uh yeah <laughs> so and this is the way i remember this is one of, one of my earliest memories one of her really dear friends was from way down there in the country the way i remember it um and if anybody could ever correct me i would love it but texas and come on, we're going to drive and we're going to go go see Texas, my friend my, from childhood or whatever. And Texas was um, a black woman, very black, very dark, very big and somber and uh, but but loving and caring. You could feel uh, and, uh, you know, I'm talking from very early in my childhood Uh when and this is one of the main things I remember when we went and we were at a place where we were seeing Texas, which was a black woman that my mom knew from way way back from the countryside. Uh, um, there was a stairwell, and I remember being in the stairwell at the bottom of the stairs. There were black and white uh, checker tiles, and I remember feeling good, like Texas radiated something that was good. And they talked a lot, but I couldn't understand what they were talking about. So that's a that's a very early memory. But one of the reasons that oh Texas Texas, te I thought in my mind of that's you know where they kill the Mexicans and the Alamo and whatever and and uh, uh, and a bad place. I thought of it already as a, as a young child that Texas was a place of some kind of dark criminality or something, killing the Indians and killing the Mexican people. And, um, and yeah, that, that, the, well, the way we learned about it is the Texas people, they didn't want to be part of the United States. So they, Mexico was 
part of another country as part. So all these Americans, they didn't want to be part of the United States. They went down there. And black people would f run away from slavery and escape to that territory, right? And um, uh, eventually some people got together and got organized and they were like, we want to uh, keep slavery, right? So we would like to bring this territory into the United States as a slave state, tip the balance in the favor of keeping slavery and so on. So, um, uh, I, uh, I was like, why would a family back early on, I did mention a good reason why, and I'm about to get back to that, but, uh, I was like, why would a black family from the countryside name their, their daughter Texas and it's really like hope because of many many years later when I read uh, Howard Zinn's People's History of the United States I found out uh, more about it and then when I looked into the educational material that's provided from the Zen project Z-I-N-N -N project I found that yeah the the stories the slaves could escape because Mexico had gotten rid of slavery and slaves could escape and, and emigrate uh, uh, to Mexico and have farms and stuff like that. And then when uh, the Civil War happened and they brought Texas, well, they brought Texas in, the Mexican-American War happened and they took all the territory of California, Arizona, New Mexico, uh, and Texas. They took all that territory from Mexico after attacking them in a war. And then they hunted down all the black people that had escaped and killed them, right? And uh, uh, but one, once I, I I really read all that, it dawned on me that yeah, if she was my mom's age, she was born in 1924, and so her parents were of an age where they could remember both slavery. And also that you could escape to the, 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 the land of hope, of, to Texas, right? And presumably, yeah. I, and this is one of the things. Um, in my experience, what, what I, I do is I go back over things in my mind. So um, I keep the, the memory the the, the uh, as much as I wish I you know it's a, it's miraculous to me how certain things can can uh, can trigger my uh, my memory like when I was talking about Texas and visiting Texas I actually have a very clear image in my mind of being in a, a house somewhere uh, and it was a bare tile floor with large foot squared uh, black and white checkered uh, tile floor um, presumably some kind of a vinyl or something uh, uh, flooring but you know cut square tiles I do believe maybe that had been put down on hardwood I'm not sure but it, it was uh, yeah that's a, a very clear image and it, it's it's like wow something uh, uh, triggered uh, that uh, to bring it back up. But I know that, you, you know, from conversations with people that you've known for many, many years, you can try this experiment where you go, tell me something about me that you remember and they'll tell you stuff, you know, they'll tell, Oh, one day you did this or said this or something like that. And, uh, you may not remember it. And then you can do the same thing with them. Okay. I'm going to tell you some, some things that I, I remember about you. Do you remember the thus and so and thus and so, and sometimes they do. Right. But some, you know, sometimes it's common that the, that they don't, or I, you know, in my experience, try it out. We need some statistics on it to measure it and things, so we know if it's if it's real or if it's just random stuff. I need to not bite my nails. Um, 
Now, I'm sitting up here in this mess, right? and I, I need to get uh, stuff organized, organizationalized, right? And sorting books by size. Whispers of Faith note card collection. Just absolutely an odd size book. Okay. What are these? Okay, these power supplies do not need to be here. They need to be over with the computers. In an organizational, they need to be in a little bin. That's what they need to be in. Okay, now, vapo pads does not belong in here. Don't bite your nails, Dave. I'm hoping that my audio is coming through good. So, yeah, uh, my mom, when she told me about, you know, the be realizing that the beatings, really, it was a way of uh, taking the heat off her. Okay, I beat them. That's what you wanted, right? It's like in her own mind, there's that social expectation. Oh, you're a single mom. You must be a bad, naughty woman, right? Uh, and so it's clear that you are, because look at your children, their behavior, right? And so she get pressure like that socially and uh, take it out on the kids. And, it, 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 you know, relief. She's got some relief. Feel a little bit better. Yeah. Like, okay, you know, I've done what you wanted, what you expected, right? And to me, that's an example. Uh, of society having a share of the blame. Uh, for the outcome that we're getting, sorry to say. Uh, So, yeah, example. Now, the, this is, you, you know that my my sister lost her first baby uh, w w to severe Down syndrome after a regular ectopic pregnancy and, and so on, her first pregnancy, and she was terribly depressed about that and saddened. And I, the, uh, the sadness was palpable when we were in the funeral home and stuff. Well, mom, uh, our mom uh, at various times, had been assaulted or molested sexually. Uh, uh, she was raped uh, numerous times, and I, I never knew it. Uh, she, uh, I guess, you you know, it's a matter of, of great shame, and you're not supposed to talk about it, right? So my mother had had this rule. Girls don't go anywhere in a, in a car with a with a man no absolutely not yeah, it's not gonna be uh, happening well let's see if I can adjust this a little bit better my 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 mom told me a story of whipping uh, my sister she, they're both passed away now but I think it's an important story because it's, uh, you know, it, it, it really happened. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, it, you know, maybe it can, it can be passed down to, to be a warning to whoso would be warned. Um, 
so my sister Susan went in a car with a boy and mom found out about it and she said this time I'm really gonna wear you out you're you're, you're getting a beating right I need you to go kneel down over the bed and uh, uh, take your take your shirt off she's gonna go across the back right and uh, so my mom's telling the story she was like you know that yeah and this in the context of like having having told me well you know your older brother that was a rape yeah so it, it really changes your perspective on it when, when you find out that your your nearest sibling you know that was a unexpected uh, unwanted uh, pregnancy that you had to uh, and that you had to stay involved with your attacker because you're desperate you know you need to have support uh, uh, to survive so I grew up thinking that this guy that had done this to my to my mom uh, was was my real father, and because I was a product of uh, a secret uh, adulterous relationship, uh, my father never did anything bad. My real father, he did lots of wonderful things for me, and uh, was always very kind. Never saw him upset or angry in my entire life. Saw him a lot over the course of the years, but. I always thought this other guy was my father and and, and my sisters, I, I didn't find out that uh, who my real father was until uh, my mom died. My sisters called me immediately. They're like, you gotta know this, you know, we got, you gotta know this. Right. And it turns out that I had not had children. Uh, Cause yeah, one of the reasons is, is I was thinking, man, that guy's bad. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't have kids. Maybe I was ambivalent about it, but anyway, my mom's whipping uh, her daughter for going uh, in a car with a boy, and uh, she said I, I kept striping her, you know, with the with the belt, and I was looking for it to turn red, and it wouldn't turn red, and 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 it wouldn't turn red, and it wouldn't turn red, and then finally, Susan sat up and she turned around slowly. And she said, it's, it's all right, mother. I know. I know. And mom said that the belt had curled. You know, a woman's breast, so very, you know, as it comes away, there's, from the body there, there's a very uh, tender place. And the belt had been uh, actually cracking right in that, on her breast. And it had torn the flesh and blood was just streaming down. You know, and it's just like my, my mom would never forget, you know, what she ha had done and how, how terrible that was. Well, my mom, my mom said that. She said, it's all right, mom. I know, I know not to go in a car with a, with a man. When my mom passed away, my, my eldest sister said, yeah, uh, you should know that uh, mom put her with a, 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 do a medical doctor from the church to be a babysitter. And that medical doctor from the church or whatever impregnated her. She's 13, 14 years old. Just old and just, start, just able to have a period and this guy got her pregnant, and there's no abortion. So, in order to save his reputation, he needed to terrorize her and and uh, procure a uh, illegal abortion, uh, which resulted in an injury and yeah, possibly, uh, you know, my sister just trying to get married as soon as possible. You know, can you imagine a world where a girl has to think like that? I don't want a world like that. She got married as soon as she could. And, yeah, probably she she had a, a, a baby that died with a very irregular pregnancy because she 
have a botched abortion. <laughs> right? So the 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 truth of of what came out when my eldest sister told me that it was so palpable because my mom just a month of several months before she died had said she sat up and turned around and blood was streaming down and she said it's all right mom i know i know i've already been pregnant <laughs> and mom yeah god rest my mom's spirit uh Donna told me she never, Susan never told her. Don't want to hurt her. Afraid she'd lose her mind. <laughs> and yeah, things happen. But it, it's important to revisit things and and uh, uh, think about things in, in a in a new light. Uh, it changes, it makes you realize that. Um, it's very hard to understand what's going on in a given situation just from surface matters, things that you can see clearly in front of you. There's a lot more underlying that, that yeah, it's harder to get to. All right, now, what I should do, this is kind of my, my book stream, and I'm supposed to be doing book stuff. But I'm going to open randomly. I'm going to do a promo for In the Hands of the Great Spirit, the 20,000-year history of American Indians. Wow. All right. In the beginning, there was endless space in which nothing existed but Tawa. The sun spirit, who gathered the elements of space and added some of his own substance. Well, that's true. Yeah, there's endless space now. And it just started out with the sun and then, you know, uh, the planets form because of, the, you know, the gravitational thing. So that's right. All right. Um, uh so the sun gives out some of his substance. Well, his substance is the, the the lumps, you know, gathering because of gravitational tendencies. All right, all right so. Uh, thereby creating the first world. This world was inhabited by insect-like creatures who lived in caves and squabbled with one another ceaselessly. It's interesting. I'm trying to visualize that. Um, spider grandmother. No, wait, wait a second. The dissatisfied Tawa sent a new spirit, spider grandmother, to lead them on a long journey, during which they changed form and grew f fur like dogs, wolves, and bears. They arrived in the second world, but still didn't understand the meaning of life. So Tawa created a third world, lighter and moist, and sent Spider Grandmother again to lead them. By the time they arrived in the third world, they had become people, and Spider Grandmother told them to renounce evil and live harmoniously with one another. They built villages and planted corn, and Spider Grandmother taught them to weave and make pots, but it was cold in the third world. The pots didn't bake and the corn didn't grow. Sometime later, a hummingbird arrived, telling of yet another world above the sky, ruled by Masa'u, Masa who was um, owner of fire and caretaker of the place of the dead. The hummingbird taught the people to make fire with a drill and left. The, oh yeah. They did that. Yeah, made fire with the drill. All right, the people learned to bake pottery in the fire and warm their cornfields with fires. Things went well in the third world until sorcerers began turning the people's minds from virtue. Men gambled. Women revolted. 
rains failed, and so did the corn. Again, Spider Grandmother arri arrived, saying that it was time to leave this world and go forth to the upper world. The chief of some wise men sent Sparrow up into the sky, and he found an opening there, but was blown away by the winds. Next, a dove was sent, flew through the opening, and found a lifeless world spreading out in all directions. He flew back and made his report. The wise men then sent a hawk, who reported the same thing, and then a catbird, who returned saying that the people had been invited to come up by Masa'u'u. But now they suppose they supposed to reach the hole uh, no but how were they supposed to reach the hole in the sky Sp spider grandmother again intervened reminding them that chipmunk planted seeds that grew into trees so they enlisted chipmunk who planted several different trees that didn't grow tall enough and finally, he tried a bamboo reed, which reached through the hole. This was called Sipapuni. 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 <laughs> and Chipmunk explained that they could climb up through it because it was hollow. The wise men drew four lines in the ground and said that any sorcerers crossing the lines would perish. Then, led by Spider Grandmother and her twin sons, the people climbed up the reed into the upper world, the present fourth world of the Hopis, the Hopi Indians. Wow. Fancy. Smallest books. These dang thingies, I, I don't, I don't like it. Uh, it's like these Chick Fil A wrapper books. You don't want to take them off because just making more trash doing that. And they're actually protecting the books, but dang it, I don't, I don't like the. That they're hanging and dangling everywhere. It's annoying. Nope. I got my daughter a uh, is that better? I got my daughter a, a, a dinosaur cute little sort of PJ dinosaur costume but it's pretty nice it's, it's like uh, it's wonderful actually extremely cute um, I have this new table. It's wonderful. So I have a another another level here to work with. Very wonderful. Joyous. <sighs> Trying to gradually get these books sorted out. This is a special square size. All right, that's a perfect match. My Little Pony. And Golden Books. You know, I'm curious. Oh. 
I, I really feel the golden books need to be in their own little separate pile. They're going to be building up in any serious sorting scenario. Okay, this is one of my daughter's favorite shadow books. Oh, look, there's another golden book. Told you. And look at that, right? All the same size. Uh, now, that that's another of the, oh, man. It's so pathetic, you know, with these, uh, Roosters off to see the world, Scholastic book, and they're they're not cheap, but yeah, this is it's ruined. The teacher's written his name on it. It's had liquid spilled on it. But yeah, good for art projects or something like that. Uh. These are the shimmer and shine, friendship divine, right? And we have the heart and the uh, sunny day. Welcome to pet parlor. These are actually in pretty good good condition and kind of in the range of this particular size of book. Now these are a little bit bigger. These are large. Okay. Oh. The Very Busy Spider, Pete the Cat, and the Perfect Pizza Party uh, a hot dog day, and if I built a car, this if I built a car is a great book. Uh, Mix your artist artist library series nine ninety nine. Mix your own watercolors. Hats off the history and meaning of hats. Elephant and piggy book. Somebody scribbled on this with a pencil. There is a bird on your head. Ooh, they scribble entire the inside the entire book. Oh, so much for that. I believe, wait a minute, 
yeah. This needs batteries. It's got to go out of here. Atlanta Fulton Public Library. East Point Library. Twenty sixteen. It's a long journey. This is a priceless. I got Mr. Mr. Peabody's Apples by Madonna. Great little story. And uh, did she really write that? <laughs> and a German edition. So I got two. Yeah. So Mr. Peabody's Apple. Apple. In der Stadt Hauptville, die keine sehr große Stadt war, gratu gratulierte Mr. Peabody seiner Schülermannschaft zu einem großen Spiel. in the town of Hatville, which wasn't a very big town, Mr. Peabody was congratulating his little league team on a great game. They had not won, but no one really cared because they'd had such a good time playing. Don't bite your nails. I need to get uh, some manicure stuff soon. You know, this is really strange. This is a very large book. Larger. I did it. 
bit by now. Wondering, yeah, my paintbrush walked. Put my two little palettes away there. Love was blown away by the night wind, and the dream we shared fell apart. Ba -da -da -da. Now I'm all alone in the night wind, the wind that brought the blues to my heart. Um, my mama done told me when I was in knee pants. My mama done told me, son. What does she tell you, a woman of sweet talk? Yeah, give you the glass eye, uh-huh. But when the sweet talking done, keep on a talking. A woman's a two-faced, a worrisome thing to leave it to sing the blues in the night. Now, I sing Cab Calloway's version of that, but I think there's an Ella Fitzgerald version where it's, a man, a, a man is a two-faced, so wear something to leave you to sing the blues in the night. If you haven't ever seen it, there is a, uh, a Porky Pig and Daffy Duck team-up cartoon with a Bugs Bunny cameo, and it's called Porky Pig's Feet, right? But it's like a feet of wonder, right? F-E-A-T, a feat. Yeah. Uh, it's a great feat of magic, a great feat of, you know, F-E-A-T, right? Not pig's feet, F-E-E-T, but it's a play on that, right? Well, what happens is uh, Daffy goes to cash a check while they're staying in the Broken Arms Motel or Hotel. They're way up on the top floor or something. Pretty high up, right? And uh, Daffy, when he's coming back, uh, if you haven't seen this, you should see it. Porky Pig's Feet. It should be on YouTube or whatever. He's playing dice with the elevator uh, man, right? And they don't show the elevator man, but he sounds pretty southern. You know what I mean? It's like, you heard Daffy on the elevator. It's like, come on, seven. Don't fail me now. <laughs> and then you hear the elevator guys like, oh, snake eyes. Use a dead duck. Duck. Right? And, and uh, he comes walking off the elevator. He's lost all his money. And they play music. As he's walking, and that's the tune. Uh, um, oh, where is something to leave you to sing the blues in the night? Right. So um, that kind of music is kind of uh, my mom's era. Um, Wow. So I, I I know maybe this uh, got it too intense, you know, when I talked about my, my sister getting that terrible whipping or whatever. 
and my even more dramatic is that that my mother who did it herself finally told the story you know and to, you know and told it in a very truthful way and um the and my the sad thing about it is i managed to reconcile with my mother uh to a point where we could really have very long and deep go back over things together and remember things and and not get upset or wound up or anything like that and revisit the things and say yeah i did this wrong you know i i i i was doing this bad and uh that's a stage that, that my mom she got to she was like here's another thing I, I did that was was bad i didn't believe you you know she i was telling her bad things about school and she was like you're just mate you're a liar you're making stuff up unbelievable look at this I hope this is not it's a little bit dirty a little bit of wear and tear but look at this Ele an elephant and piggy biggie 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 book volume three I can't I can't believe that there are that many of these This is a wonderful book. Oh my goodness, this is going to my daughter tomorrow. Oh, and I, I wish that uh, you had been able to see. She actually stood in a doorway and I read Green Eggs and Ham to her. At first when she saw it, and she, she was like, no, don't read it. Oh, you know, like she's going to panic or something like that. But I, I kind of enticed her a little bit with the, you know, I am Sam. Sam, I am. I do not like green eggs and ham. Would you like them? In a chair? Would you like them in your hair? Would you like them in the face? <laughs> would you like them all over the place? I would not like them. Yeah. Yeah, we, 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 I'm making that up, you know, but we, she actually got riveted to that story. And I think it's a, it's a, yeah, it was, it was a great uh, early learning, early reading uh, book for me. And uh, I don't mind still reading it today. I think if you're into books, you should definitely read all Dr. Seuss's Yertle the Turtle, right? <laughs> really a great book. And it sounds like, a, yeah, Miss Dr. Seuss is, yeah, kind of misrepresented. They don't, you know, the when right wingers say the left does not want you to read uh, Dr. Seuss because he was a racist, right? Don't what they want is they want the left to go, oh, Dr. Seuss was a racist. I don't want to read him because I got to be politically correct because I do everything conservatives tell me I am because I know I'm against them. <laughs> don't do that, folks. Be yourself, you know, the whole conservative and it's all ideology crap. And uh, it really is just a lot of nonsense is what it is. It's a construct, a linguistic construct, and it's in your own mind. So don't fall into that trap. If you if, if you got into it, you know, you could play so many different angles. Dr. Seuss the real person, uh, I think he was, you know, had some, a little bit of sordid background in the military and, you know, sowing his wild oats and stuff. But then there's another story about him that he, he left his wife and ran off with somebody else. Ooh. Yeah, guys do that. Women do it too sometimes. Sure do. That's why we need egalitarian equalitanism, equalitanationisms of egalitarianismness. Yeah, that would help. Um, so what my point is is like you could say, uh, Doctor Seuss is the the conservatives could say, 
oh, Dr. Seuss is a left winger, and he he's uh, uh, was fooling around with whores and stuff and, and when he was in the army, and then he abandoned his wife. All these things are true. <laughs> So good conservatives should not like him or read anything that, you know, that's what they really want is, is for you not to read something like Yertle the Turtle. Yertle the Turtle is like the story of Donald Trump. <laughs> Plain and simple. Conservatives really don't want you to read it. Right? <laughs> Real, you know, conservatives in the sense of the people that are in power, the right wing. The old guard, the ones that don't want to change. Um, the reason they don't want to change is because things are going fine for them. <laughs> as long as they continue to be fine, they don't want you to mess it up. And it may be that things are going fine to them because of detriment being done to you. <laughs> right? So it does become a pressing, sometimes, uh, a pressing issue. I would, and I always like to draw the connection to the uh, Sulla. This is, Sulla was a dictator close to the collapse of the Roman Republic, right? So if you, like, I, 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 don't, I don't know much about my audience generally on here yet. I don't, I don't have a significant amount of regular followers to know if you have any background in Roman history. But um, the they had a republic, as it were. They had slavery, of course, and they were imperial and stuff. But men could have a say in how things were done or whatever. But they they had some cycling uh, of, the, uh, of uh, uh, political change that brought about a collapse of the republic. And for, like, if you're a Christian or something like that, you might put it like, like, Julius Caesar is assassinated, and then there's some civil strife. That's the end. The, uh, the, his, ne his adopted nephew, Octavianus, uh, becomes the emperor. Now, to place this in terms of what you know about the, gospel if you're the gospels or the writings of paul and so on uh pontius pilate the gospel says he was a procurator very low level not much power no he is false <laughs> the gospels are wrong we know who pilate was and he you know he rose uh, from being like a knight a roman equestrian horse uh horse combat and and you know maybe sexual favors like were reputed to anthony or whatever he gradually rose in rank and uh the his time uh being in charge of judea israel what we now call palestine this whole area his his administration of that he was governor we know that you know we have found in my lifetime we know also he's a real person i mean a lot of stuff in the gospels it's like you find stuff in the Gospels like this widow's, the two cents, she only has two cents and she gives from her poverty. And so her two cents is worth more than the people that give out of their wealth, right? That turns up in some uh, 500 year earlier, so the widow's might, and it's this, uh, I think it's a Buddhism story. Now, this this is all open to debate, you know, because this stuff was translated by English people, and uh, 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 you know they can't be trusted. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, Paul Karras, I think is is where I got that from. He wrote a book called The Gospel of the Buddha, and there's you know I think it's open to question that Paul Karras could have made this stuff up. He could have copied gospel stories, or the Gospels themselves are old enough that good stuff could have been lifted in the manuscript culture of Buddhists and, and a, you know, became a syncretic thing that got on to Buddhism. It's a very complicated, when you try to reconstruct stuff, ancient stuff like that, it's a, it's a very complex uh, 
uh, process. But the fall of the Roman Republic is when we're talking about right before it. And the reason I'm talking about it is because it's worrisome that we have this trouble with liberals and conservatives. And I'd like to point out the liberals and conservatives, the fight. La Violencia, look it up on Wikipedia. Like in Colombia, they had this uh, uh, thing going on. You know, Colombia used to be part of Panama. The United States kind of machinated the breakup of Colombia became a, a, a separate country, and they had political strife, and, and the West was involved in it, had their, uh, you know, America was involved in it. And we have a thing called the Monroe Doctrine that basically says your country was it's ours, you know, so don't mess with us. But um, uh, what, what is it? The Bogotosa, I guess, is, uh, and the, uh, the La Valencia is uh, uh, the, the Bogotosa is when the liberals and the conservatives, you know, liberals elected, I think, uh, to public office, and he's assassinated by a conservative. And then there's a big strife, and you know, like 3,000 people got killed. They fought with each other, the liberals and the conservatives. Whew, you don't want that happening, right? Um, but what happened with Sulla is he had uh, legions under his his command and you had some some uh social breakdown that was going on an example of a stress of roman uh, if you have this empire then you take farmers away from their farmland right so rich people need to loan these people money Right, they borrow against the farmland that they leave fallow. They go off to a war and they come back and they're in debt to these senators who can then say, "Well, you know, we said we were going to give you a break, but we're not. We're just going to repossess your land, and you just be a day laborer or something, or try to flee the country or something like that." Right. So the, this is an example of a stress that was going on. You had. Julius Caesar's uh, uh, position was uh, on the the popul the popularis is what they were called. Those are the liberals, you know, ones that we need change to address some of these social crises that we're facing. And then the optimares, right? Those were the conservatives. They're like, no, everything's fine. We don't need to change stuff. Everything's working like it's supposed to work. This is a great country. What are you talking about? You don't love this country, love it or leave it, that kind of thing. And they got into a big fight, and they, they the conservatives called for, the the, the optimaries called for military uh, uh, to come in and suppress these reformers, the, the liberals, you know, come in and suppress them. And uh, so Sulla is trying to get his military troops uh, uh uh, into position to, to invade his own, militarily occupy his own capital, right? And he's, he tells the conservative envoys, right, the, 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 uh, the right wing, what, what, what is it, the, uh, the optimares, he's like, just go and kill as many of the, go back into the city and just fight it out, kill as many of them as you can, and I'll just roll in in the morning and we'll take care of things from there. So... All through the night, they fought. Just the story I version I heard, they just killed as many as they could. Had a bloody combat all through the night, and then Sulla rolled in right with legions marching, and he had all the people rounded up and put in the circus, uh, big arena, right? Uh, uh, the under under imperial guard, right? And he t assumed the dictatorship. He, he gathered the Senate together, and he had, you know, basically uh, the s Roman soldiers under his command are standing there with with a knife. They can kill anybody. They have spears, you know, and they're st they completely surround the senators. They're standing there in their togas or whatever. And he's like, I'm taking over. Say, I'm taking over. Like Edward G. Robinson. I'm taking over. Say, little Caesar. Right. No, it's not like that. But that's what he did. He took over, and uh, he, while he was taking over, he had, he had given the command that while he was announcing the dictatorship, everybody in the circus, conservatives and liberals alike, would be killed. 
they shared something in common, right? They had ideas about things that they they were not supposed to be involved in. <laughs> they had involved themselves in the affairs of government, and that just was not going to happen. <laughs> and the thing that if you were out and you were fighting, right, and you're uh, uh, optimares, that that label or populares, the thing that you have in common that makes you all the same is that you've involved yourself in stuff that's none of your business. Why? Because I can kill you if you don't, you know, leave me alone, right? So Sulla famously, he's like, he has um, everybody killed, left and right. You know, just leave behind the, the, the dummies <laughs> that uh, don't get involved in politics. Very ter terrifying. Should, and both conservatives and liberals, <laughs> yeah, you need to get a dialogue going. You're just being played uh, uh, to be set against each other. They don't, More than anything else, they want uh, uh, people to be divided, ad atomized, and... Um, you know, for you're dealing with the kind of people that, like, oh, it's okay for the planet is destroyed because we're going to space. <laughs> Got people like that in charge, man. Think about it. <laughs> uh, that everything's going great for them. They got billions. They got so many billions they can go to space. <laughs> they don't have to worry about. It. <laughs> They're in a different world, and that's what Aristotle. Aristotle was a teacher of Alexander the Great. Incidentally, it changed world history. In more ways than one. <laughs> um, let me see if this fits here. Not really, but I'm going with it. It's pretty close. Um, but Aristotle called oligarchy a perversion of aristocracy. I think I think that's what he called it. Look it up and read it. You can listen to audio books on online. Uh, Aristotle's Politics, and I, I think, yeah, it's good to 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 give a listen to it. Uh, he says things that I don't agree with, uh, but nevertheless, he did analyze uh, a lot of government structures and systems of his time, which still influence our systems of government and cooperation today. Uh, I, I, another reason I would make the case to read Aristotle's politics is, uh, you know, if you're interested in the Bible, if you're Jewish, right? If you're interested in the, the Bible as history, um, uh, the historical period of the Bible, yeah, it, it, we're sure when you get up to things like uh, Maccabees, the, uh, the Hasmoneans and stuff, we know that, 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 that stuff, that's real history, right? The historicity of Moses, for example, is problematic. Uh, uh, and this is another thing. I don't think people should take my word for it. I've read a lot because I've tried at least. But, um, you know, some fundamentalist religious people would be like, how dare you say that the historicity of Moses is problematic. You know, that's going against Islam or it's going against Judaism. You're destroying our religion or something like that. Well, you know, uh, I don't know. Let's read the Wikipedia article. I mean, and, and check the references. It's actually better than some... The Wikipedia article sometimes is better than actual lectures that I've, I've, I've been on. on. It's uh, some good work out there and a good baseline to find out where you need to go to find out about these things. I'll give you, to the best of my memory, there is, uh, and, and look, check it yourself. <laughs> you should. There's there's a, a place called El Amarna, and this is just my memory. I, I you know, I was like, 14, 15, when I was reading about biblical archaeology, very fascinated in uh, the historicity of, of, of things, or lack thereof, right? Because uh, the Egyptian record doesn't really attest 
uh, the Jews at the level that they're attested by the Jews, right? Well, that's natural. But, yeah, Egyptians also, you find if you study Egyptian history, they're notorious. They tried to erase, they had a female pharaoh, and, at, you know, and during her reign or whatever, she her face was everywhere and stuff was written about her just like other pharaohs and then when she was that when she was gone they tried to expunge her you know from the historical record and egyptians uh, uh historians of egypt will say you know the egyptians they always carve in stone we won you know whatever happened or, or it may have been a when they record it it was it was great you know <laughs> And I guess that makes sense. If you're going to chisel something in stone, it's going to be like, uh, look on my works, you mighty in despair. <laughs> Nothing beside remains. Found that, can't, that colossal, right? Found there. But anyway, uh, tell Elamorna, right? What is a tell? A tell is like over thousands of years, an area of human habitation uh, uh, may be abandoned due to famines or, you know, the chain wars and stuff like that. And, and then, uh, uh, the, the wreckage or ruin or whatever may be, uh, uh, is buried and then it becomes a slightly elevated area and people build on top of it. And then it becomes a good place for fortification. You can mine it for masonry and stuff like that and rebuild stuff and, and, uh, it eventually becomes a big hill, right? And Jericho, for example, was built on a tell. It's the city of Jericho, the real city, uh, uh, is uh, probably uh, our, the information I have at this time. says probably human habitation was there, we know, back at least 8,000 B.C., which is... More than 8,000 BC, it was more than 10,000 years ago. People were there. So there's a tell there. It's a big built up place, very many different levels to it. So there's a, a tell in Egypt. And the story that I got, which should be checked, of Tel El Amarna is that locals found tablets there. You know, they used to uh, 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 write stuff on tablets with, a, with a, the the non-carving form of hieroglyphics, right? And they, at great expense, they said, these are, we've discovered something really valuable. At great expense, they transported them to a French, I'm pretty sure it was a French museum official. And this could be the story of the Moabite stone. That's, a, yeah, I want to go, I want to go look it up. But the way I remember is that the Tel El Amarna tablets uh, uh, were pronounced fakes, and that the people that had them just threw them on the backs of they, they, we can't we can't afford to transport them back the way that we transported them in right but we're taking them back if you're not going to buy them right so they took these tablets back and and broke them up uh, there uh, but but then uh, uh, if I remember correctly they were deciding that well the fragments of these tablets could be uh, overall get us more uh, money because then they'll be trying to collect the pieces and stuff, you know, because they're just trying to get the money for it. Tragedy. But in these tablets, there was a narrative about the Habiru people, Habiru, which have been associated with the Hebrews, being expelled because they had a plague, right? <laughs> right? Which is a biblical story. The Jews, uh, 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 Mo Moses brought all these plagues or whatever. <laughs> um, and, but that's what you're looking at if you're trying to get historicity of the period of Moses. Uh, uh, another thing, Moses is the same, you know, we, we uh, Jews, we say it's, it's, it's for drawn out, right? But uh, I think modern linguistics is like, uh, it's obvious that this is this Moses is, is the same as Ramses. It just in, in Egyptian Moses means born of the one that was born of, and Moses is is like whereas it's the same as in Ramses, right? In Egyptian, uh, 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 
Ramses, we say, is the son of Ra, the one that's born of the sun, right? So when you put uh, Moses there and you make this kind of drawn out of the water, there is linguistically problematic that they did that. That's the information that Jews passed down, uh, but it, you know, it seems to be quite a faded memory, right? So the, these Habiru uh, went through all this terrible stuff, and the story that we have today is, uh, yeah, somewhat fragmentary, and there's disagreement about the, for example, the Samaritans. You know, there's still some Samaritans today, and they said, no, we got the, the Torah, God gave it to us on a different mountain, <laughs> A lot of people don't realize that, but yeah. But the th the thing about the thing about it is is uh, th that you have Samaritans that say no, it wasn't Moses, it was our, our guy. <laughs> That's very interesting. It lends uh, you know pro something back there did happen. They're talking about something that really, you know, it's not just total mythology. Uh, you find this when you study uh, uh, Hinduism in any depth. Uh, they, they have epic poems that, the in order to people used to at a very early day memorize uh, huge long poems, lengthy poems of history, and during the British empire the english were like you know they're anglicans they're like no you, none of this history happened it doesn't sync up with noah's ark and stuff <laughs> stupid stuff like that you know this this is the thing we had a a thing at my temple the other day about uh about the the stuff on noah's ark and if if you haven't uh visited it from a jewish perspective it, it, it really, there's family trauma and, and all, all kind of stuff in there that's, uh, yeah, it really reflects, even down to this day, cultural things. Uh, but um, in that that period, uh, there some people have proposed, and, and the uh, some investigators said, no, no, no. Some have proposed that you have these three flood stories that seem to be talking about a very similar event. One is a Greek one. The Greeks said, well, it wasn't Noah. It was this guy, Deucalion. And then they tell this similar story to the, to the Jewish story, right? And then the Babylonians had a story. They had, in their epic of Gilgamesh, right? Uh, there's uh, Utnapishtim, who the gods gave him immortality and... Uh, uh, Gilgamesh wanted to discover uh, uh, his when Enkidu, his best pal, or whatever dies. He loves him so much that he just embraces him, and he would not let him go until he saw a, a worm, you know, begin like a maggot or whatever was crawling out of his eye. That's the very wow. That's a very he loved this guy so much. That's a Babylonian epic of Gilgamesh, and after that ha happened. Uh, Gilgamesh is like I've got it. This death, it's like, it's like Frankenstein. You know, it's like this death is so terrible. We have to end it, right? So I have to go and discover immortality. And the way I have to, I have to, I have to go uh, to uh, Utnapishtim, who saved the world from the great flood, gathered the animals into an ark, and all that stuff. So that's that's back there there too. And if you if you look at that story, it says well. There's a there are a bunch of Babylonian gods, right? And some of them are good, and some of them are bad, and capricious, and stuff like that. With respect to what? With respect to men, in particular. So there is a goddess, and her name is Astart Easter or Ishtar or something like that. I can't remember. Uh, uh, Astart uh, uh, Ishtar, right? And uh, you check it. You should go look it up. Uh, Ishtar uh, gets annoyed because when mankind flourishes over the earth or whatever he makes too much noise and all the racket she's like it's just too noisy so i've decided to drown everybody 
completely wipe out all life on Earth because they just. You know, I'm trying to get some peace up in here. Is what her attitude was, and uh, so so one. I think you know. Check it. It's 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 it doesn't take a, but a day to read this whole story. Uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh. It's online for free. Um, I would read it again if I had time right now. I'd sit down and read it. I would like to, but as you can see, I've got other things I need to do. But um, one of the good gods that goes to Utnapishtim and said, look, she's mad as all get out and you're doomed, right? She's going to she's gonna flood the earth and uh, and we can't stop her, but you could build an ark, right? Put all the animals in, right? Two by twos and stuff. And the whole thing, just like in the, right? Uh, and then, then so he, he uh, yeah. and I can't remember all the details of the story. I should read it again. I should read it on this book show, right? Um, but, um, In the Jewish, when, when you, like, you may be Jewish and you may, well, well you know, there's no such thing as Jewish people, actually. Because, yeah, you, you know, you, you know, some, some Jews are just not religious at all, you know, they're just people, you know, you know they have some ethnic background and stuff. And me, I'm like a, 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 a mud. I, I have Hispanic, uh, a Jew chromosomes, and I have, uh, Central European Jewish chromosomes, right? And but Central European Irish uh, chromosomes, more. I have I have also Roma, South Slavic, and, and Italian. Um, just a, a total a total mutt, and a very you know a very you know sometimes I'm I'm like an atheist, right? And sometimes I'm not. Uh, I see, I, I have some experience of God, wow. but it's, it's a, the, the, it's a personal experience. It's something that cannot be shared with anybody. And that's why you call it atheism, right? Because some people say, well, my God, he sits on this throne. It's over here. He has a light bulb for a head and all this stuff like that. Yeah. I don't believe in your God. I'm sorry. That's something that's in your own brain. It's made up of all the stuff that you were taught or whatever like that. And for me, I'm having an experience, uh, yeah, different. Uh, but it's there, yeah. It helps me uh, uh, survive uh, uh, ordeals and stuff. But it's not the guy with the light bulb for a head that burns people forever. I don't believe in hell or anything like that. Some Hindus would be very upset. Everybody knows hell's on the South Pole, right? In the astral plane of the of the South Pole. When you die, you become a, a ethereal and you have to travel from wherever you are, like the Indian subcontinent. You have to go on the road to hell, which is the throne of Yama on the South Pole. But you're in the ethereal realm and it's a horrific terrible long road to, to get there. It takes months, you know, to travel there <laughs> as a ghost, as an ethereal ghost or whatever. But there, this the hellish punishment, right? It's what you get, right? Uh, yeah. Really? <laughs> I don't believe it. Skeptical. Because, um, you know, it's like when I was little, yeah, I was scared of hell. I really believed it. And some, some, some Jews... Uh, believe in and Gehenna as a as a place and in the commentary, it will say that it's on the North Pole and I'm like, wait a minute, commentary on uh, scripture. Okay, back to what I was saying. Uh, if you're if you're a Christian, for example, you read the Bible. For for Jews, that's just like the ab. That's it's Tanakh or whatever. It's like what is read. Everybody has to read this much. That's the absolute minimum. Now think about it. Have you read the whole Bible, the Ketuvim, the the prophetic books? Have you really read it from cover to cover? I, you know, it's it's a big, big. It's a bunch of of, of books there, five books, um, 
and then the 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 writings all the stuff the prophetic books uh, uh, it's, 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 it's not trivial and a lot of Christians they have these well they make the Bible so you can carry them around with you and so the text is microscopic who would want to read that <laughs> so you never read it really yeah, certainly not taking it seriously um, but some some uh, there's a lot that's just the what you have is agada which is commentary about all the details right and it used to be that a lot of stuff was only transmitted orally but around the time of the uh, uh, year 100 and about about the time of the year 135 AD but our common era uh, there was this is like a century after the crucifixion, the execution, the death penalty of Jesus by the governor, not procurator. <laughs> he was not a procurator, he's a governor, right? So, yeah, the fall of the Roman Republic is right there because you had Augustus, uh, Augustus Caesar. When he died, Tiberius became emperor. And ti when Tiberius was emperor, that's when Jesus lived, right? And uh, that's when Pilate was appointed governor. And it's also during that time period that he was recalled for being bad at it. <laughs> uh, which Josephus records that Tiberius never recalled. He really did not believe politically in recalling uh, uh, a governor. So if a governor was a high public official, an administrator of a province, uh, had to be removed, had to be recalled to Rome for trial or something like that, it had to be totally a mess, right? You know, the whole thing going up in flames, which, yeah, it was a mess. And getting worse, let's say, feel silly. My, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so when you get to that, that period, like the book of Maccabees or whatever, you have a lot of stuff we know is real history. Whereas you go back to the time of Abraham, uh, it's hard to to verify things. Abraham, for example, uh, we have a lot of commentary, and you you probably remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, if you that that's a very famous uh, story, uh, uh, the the fiery furnace and all that stuff. And Nimrod, Nimrod probably is the one that built the Tower of Babel and all that stuff. It's hard to pin him down as a real historical figure. But Judas Maccabeus, no, we know that dude, right? He's He was real. Pontius Pilate, yeah, he's definitely a real person. Uh, uh, but you can go back a certain distance in history and time, and it's, it's, uh, it's not clear. As you get to know me... Uh, One of the things that has been a very, very painful upheaval for me in my life is because when I was when I was very young, you know, I was learning things like, oh, well, yeah, hell is sort of a made up place. You shouldn't be terrorized of hell. Right. Because it's like originally Gehenna was just a, a garbage dump that the, the worm sleeps not and the, and the fire burns eternally just meant that 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 was the incinerator it was a it was a defiled place where you burn garbage it's not like a real place um so you don't have to be afraid of a of eternal torment and i was and 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 i was yeah being in a, a jewish a secular jewish environment yeah there's a lot of looking at there's a lot of looking at uh uh the Bible is like, what are these Christians, what are they thinking? You know, where do they, where do they get this idea or something like that? And you're, you're, you're looking at it and you're like, 
oh, look, this is wrong. You know, they've got this mixed up and that mixed up. You know, how did this is all pandering to the Romans and uh, yeah, uh, making Pilate look like such a tender hearted guy. Oh, I had a bad dream that, you know, I really don't want to hurt Jesus, but the Jews, yeah, forced me to it. Right. That's bull crap. <laughs> Uh, obvious, yeah, provable bull crap. Um, uh, yeah, sorry, but but for, for okay, what I'm trying to express is I did not want Iraq to get bombed or Iran. I didn't want the Iran Iraq war to happen because yeah, there's a lot of ancient history. You know, per, the history of Persia, the history of uh, so many kinds of human history. This is a seat of human civilization. You know, just drop bombs on it. My God, Rumsfeld, you kidding? George Bush, just trying to tweak the oil prices, you know? Yeah, let's, let's cause some mayhem and we'll make a killing when the oil prices go off the charts. We don't even have to get any of the oil. We'll be millionaires and we can just walk away from it, man. I felt so upset about that, man, because, yeah, um, the the Jews, you know, the think of the Jews were, well, you know, the Garden of Eden is, you know, that's Babylon, it's Iraq, right? That's where the Bible says it was, you know, what is, you don't want to tear up, mess up with the archaeology of a place like that, you know, with thousands of years of human civilization there. The, the, the treasures that might be lost, you know, if you if you mess with something like that. And just because of oil, man, we're wrecking the we're wrecking the world with oil. So I was so distraught about you know, because okay. Don't take my word for it if you don't know, but but look it up, you know. I the way I when I did re some research on it, and I don't have all the stuff right in front of me but I had read from some sources that uh, they wanted, uh, the United States wanted a secular, uh, uh, they did not want an Islamic political party in Iraq during the 1960s. I think Kennedy was in office or whatever. And uh, they wanted, uh, the, 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 they, they were involved, the CIA was involved in uh, knocking over uh uh, the the government of Iraq uh, to get the Ba'ath Party into power, and that subsequent to that, they were not satisfied with the leadership of the Ba'ath Party, so they they uh, managed to get oops. Let me see if my audio is still working. They managed to get. Uh, some kind of coup, get Saddam Hussein into power. We have pictures of, yeah, all the, th Donald Rumsfeld, you know, oh man, Saddam, I just can't wait to shake your hand. You're my kind of guy. There's a picture of him when they're cutting deals and stuff with Saddam, and, you know, and then the, the, the way I read it too, well, one thing I read about this whole thing with the Kurds is that the United States did not want a corridor of ethnic Kurdish people that connected Iranian territory across Iraq to Syria. I could be wrong, you know. I, I you know, I just the the basic memory of it is that that was the 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 political economy of it, right? That. We uh, want Saddam to, yeah, put down these Kurds, and we don't want some kind of nationalism coming up here. So we provided uh, nerve gas or sarin or something for Saddam to uh, go and gas these his own people. But I mean, really, it's really the United States' own people. When the United States provide you poison gas and put a gun to your head and say, "Go kill," it's really, you know. Just remember, baby, all the while you belong to me. Right? It's really the United States that owns these people's lives and stuff when they're doing stuff like that. <laughs> but I don't know if I, 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 you know, I, I was having a pretty bad 
emotional feeling about what was going on when all that stuff was happening. I really was. And I was like, if this happens, I, I just can't even live in this country. Uh, and I, I've, I've thought about that, you know. Uh, but uh, one of the things that happened was while, while I was in China is uh, uh, in Chinese culture, you get this thing about, you know, in, the, in your heyday, you know, or whatever of your life or whatever, you travel over the world and, you know, do, do your best or whatever. And then when you start to get older, you go back home to your original hometown and try to live out the rest of your days there. Li Bai did that. He got caught up in a palace in, in, intrigue and uh, escaped with his, without get, being executed. Could have been executed. Li Tai Bai, right? Zhao Zi Bai Di Cai Yun Jian, Qian Li Jiang Li Yi Ru Hua, Liang Ba Hua Sheng, Liang Ba Yuan Sheng Ti Bu Zhu, Qing Zhou Yi Guo Wang Chong Shan. This is Li Bai's poem about leaving by day in the morning, leaving, going back to his hometown, going back to Sichuan or whatever, and towards as he began. And Du Fu also was a poet that, from that period. So that's a thousand years ago. There's parallels. Uh, um, but that moved me, that exposure to that culture moved me when my mom passed away and I had friends here who were like, please come back, man, I can't make it on my own and you're the only person I trust and we'll do something together. And so, so, so I came back and I, I've actually been working in a elementary school in the, in a very rough neighborhood down near the, near the airport. Um, that's going to be closed down. I, I quit. I quit this year cause somebody made my kids cry. <laughs> I was tired of it, man. I was like, I'm going to go home and make my daughter laugh. And that's what I've been doing. Send me some PayPal or love. You send me some hearts on the chat or something like that. No, I'm okay. Uh, I've almost, my house is almost paid for. Trying to pay it down as quick as I can. Um. This is funny. It's like, yeah, I'm like built in here. Starting again. It's the cask of Amontillado. The cask of Amontillado. Right. Uh, this, I've got this like Essen Gospel book, and I know it's got to go somewhere else. And um, What needs to happen now? I know what I'm doing. I've got I've got another book size stack evolving and these square books need to go on top of it. I am going to do training and uh, I, I don't, I don't know uh, any, if you might've seen the earlier stream today, I was doing some test work. Um, but right now I'm in, in the playroom, in the book room, uh, dealing with this big situation as it were. Um, but if you saw the earlier stream and I, I'll, I'll get it on there, you know, what, what I'm doing with the big HD, uh, monitors is I'm trying to come up with a way to, uh, to stream, uh, uh, training, 
like my, my idea is I'm going to uh, reform. I've got a, a machine in there, the main machine with my best graphics card and the, the, the big monitor displays. And I am going to uh, reformat it and then uh, do training on all the setup of, uh, of software uh, for streaming, gaming, uh, the whole bit, you know, top to bottom, game development stuff, uh, 3D stuff, everything. Uh, so one of the big things that I did uh, for many years in China is just train uh, people how to how to get the software onto their machine and baseline how it how it works and do some modeling. A lot. Um, uh, of what I my teaching focused on was uh, physics uh, rendering. Well, no, I was really a generalist. Uh, physics, rendering effects, game development, animation production. Generally, uh, we basically in our course we we would take a pencil sketch and then come out with a 3D animation at the other end of it. It was the whole nine yards. Run the gamut. As we say, uh, Yeah, people tell you they're they're the Repu they're Republicans. You can say this to them. <laughs> Republics, yeah. Rome that was a republic. It was an experiment. Didn't work. <laughs> Ended in a empire, right? And sort of like uh, what what Aristotle said. Uh, would happen. Ooh. Oh no. This is small stuff. It was that panda book. That's what led to disaster. I've got a little, uh, Panda book with a squeaky uh, thing. Now, now my book stack is perfect. Oh, there's no batteries in here. This also, you know, I've got the the remote control uh, cars uh, in here and they really need to go back to my room to get uh, batteries loaded into them two controllers um, got another Dell Power supply needs to go back here. The instructions for the planet planetary mobile. I want to be doing that with my daughter here soon. I've been trying to get in touch with uh, the people from my school. I've been hearing rumors that 
They're closing down. Out this box. Don't want the stuff to get lost or fall out for that matter. Now I've got a Mac here. We'll only take an HD monitor. I'm thinking I have the perfect place for this. Um, in the, the game cave or whatever, there's a keyboard set up for my daughter to practice, and we could put this Mac like right next to it and put all the cool Mac uh, music teaching software on it. Uh, that would be wonderful. A lot of reasons to celebrate. Sure are. Ooh, let's say. Cool book. The Lego Book of Monsters. Zen pencils. Wow, cool stuff. These aren't the largest books, and lo and behold. Yeah. If I built a car, multiple copies of it. Yeah, um, they hired, um, they had to hire a lot of new teachers at the school where I was teaching. And I've been teaching for a long time, really. I never, well, I taught, uh, uh, as an instructor at Georgia State University, you know, basically train, you, you know, it's like they're in academics, but they can't, they can't do computer jobs, right? So it's like, <laughs> what do you guys have a college here for? Uh, I, you know, I was going to class, and you know, the thing was, is computers made things change so fast that teachers with um, PhDs, when we were there, they, 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 their computer, you know, as far as getting it into the curriculum, keeping up with the rest of the United States and the world, they were having a, having a hard time. And so I was, you know, I was training student assistants to do real computer work. And I would go, like, I, I went to take a, a class back then. This is, and this guy's probably passed away by now, but there was the, a guy had managed to get, you know, he's like, I'm a big computer guy, and we're visualizing molecules and stuff, and Irix Explorer, and, stuff, and uh, give me millions. And, and he got millions for the math and computer science department, but then proceeded to, like, break up the department, split computer science off from mathematics. And I think it's a bad idea. <laughs> Um, detrimental to, to both uh, uh, computer science and to the, the math department to do that. And this guy, it turned out when I took his class, 
he wasn't a computer rendering programmer. He had a PhD in chemistry. And I go in to take a programming class, and he, his whole lecture is like the introduction to uh, a C programming book on uh, ray tracing. And I needed somebody to teach how to program. That's what the class was supposed to be. And he, he was like, you know, I can't do this. You have to go do it. Turn it in and I'll give you a gray. <laughs> Otherwise, you're not getting nothing. Right? <laughs> Which is, yeah, got you by the, you know what. Um, so, so yeah, I, I was going to a student that was a C programmer. And uh, eventually it was like, you know, really, I'm getting absolute. I, I'm spending all this time going to a class. I just withdrew. Right? I'm going to a class. I get nothing in the class, but I lose all the time of s many hours a week sitting in there while this guy, uh, 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 you jerk, brat, kids, whatever, you know, just get me out of here. I'm, I'm highfalutin. Right? Whatever, dude. I need somebody to teach me how to do this stuff. And I had a, a guy that was uh, teaching me so much of the programming that I, that I was like, the student here is, knows way more than this professor, right? And, and I needed to drop the class, you know. Second time, I got bamboozled into taking a class with him. He's supposed to be a 3D Studio Max animation expert. I was already teaching uh, for Autodesk resellers. Right, so I was working uh, for several regional reseller offices. So to prepare, like I, I knew I knew so much about 3D Studio Max. Zero day wears much, right? Uh, that when you're a reseller, you're the guys that sell your product have to pass a test of knowledge of the product to even be able to sell it, right? And that's what I did. I prepared people, and it was kind of a hard test, actually. Um, but I'm going into a class with a chemistry professor, and he so doesn't know the software <laughs> that he's, like, hitting, he's, like, puts three, three I think it's Alt-X or something, he's, like, trying to alt control alt something or he she got the shortcut wrong and he put it in expert mode and then he's just like well can't have a class because it doesn't work he did the second time he did that i was like let me help you just hit this key but then he acted like a jerk towards me you know it's like you're trying to say or you you showed that i don't know what i'm doing so i want to kill you yeah probably that's what was going through his mind uh Because, yeah, I'm, I'm supposed to be, they bamboozled me into taking this course because there's, there, I was like, well, you know, do you have a computer, an animation uh, degree? And they're like, yeah, we got an animation master's degree, communication master's. And, uh, but I, where's the computers? You know, well, we got this Mac lab and stuff. The Mac stuff will be over here. And then the uh, three Studio Macs and Maya and stuff and uh, uh, SGI stuff, alias I'll be over irix and everything lightscape that'll be over in uh the computer science department under scott owen so i i go and i take scott owen's class man you don't know what he's doing man and then i i i i, I work really hard i do a, a project where I, i'm trying to solve all these architectural model modeling problems in 3d 3d studio max and th at the time it was it was kind of a mess for doing that stuff uh, I, I really needed guidance uh, uh, by someone who was really working seriously with the application. And I turned in uh, a homework project that I thought was very low quality, very low level. And he's like, no student could do this. You copied it from the Internet. You download it. You get an F. <laughs> and I had to go defend myself to the chairman of the department. I was like, look, here's here's all the, I, I made screen recordings when I was, 
I was thinking at the time because I already trained students, right? Well, I'll just record everything while I'm working, so my students will be able to look at it and 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 do do the stuff too. So I go to the department. I'm like, look, here's a, I made the stuff. Here's the screen recordings. He has no evidence. And so the guy told Owen to chill out on me a little bit. And he said, well, you did the project wrong. Do it over again the way I said, which is just make a box and have the camera move towards it. You know, have a door open and the camera goes, huh? you know. I dropped the class. Uh, I was like, guys, I'm, I'm doing closed circuit television production for the Robinson College of Business. Uh, I'm, I'm training for Autodesk resellers. I'm trying to get this master's degree. I'm already doing so much work for Georgia State University. It's, it's like, it's my fault. You know, I'm doing too much because I'm hyper. I, I have ADHD and uh, very energetic. Mind's going all over the place. Have all these ideas and everything. And um, yeah, but... <laughs> There, there's there's a point where you realize, hey, I'm hyperactive, but wait a minute, I'm the only one who can do this crap here, right? This guy's a phony. He can't he can't even do it, right? And I, you know, uh, accuses me of uh, plagiarizing something that, oh, it's just crap. You know, I really do need professional uh, uh, help, and I can't get it from you. But I had a Chinese university that was like. You, when they, you know, I had no PhD. I had certainly had no art degree. That's an example of meritocracy, right? The, uh, I had no PhD, but they're like, you worked for Autodesk resellers? Or are you trained Autodesk resellers for the right, to sell the AutoCAD products or whatever. Yeah, we want to hire you. We'll bring it, you know. I was like, yeah, I can I can do animation, you know. I didn't show the stuff that I, I didn't even show the stuff that I made for the dang film school at Georgia State University. thought it was awful. Uh, bloody violent. That's what they were teaching us. They were like, well, you know, when you start out, I go, go, Thomas Sula wasn't like this. I had a guy, Thomas Sula. I got some good theoretical stuff, but it wasn't, there wasn't enough grounding coming into it the way I was uh, with a mathematics background. Uh, man, the mathematics in this country is really bad. We're going to pay for it. But um, uh, Thomas Sula got me some good theory, but the, the other... The other guys there, um, crap, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, I quit the master's program. I was hired to work as, uh, well, it, I was required to be able to teach in the Chinese language. So what I had to do to do this, in case you're interested, if you want to go and be a foreign expert in China, you can do it. Like a, a thing that would be a uh, wide open field uh, is biology. Uh, China is behind uh, uh, the United States, uh, certainly uh, in, in biology, um, but they want to catch up. So if you would learn Mandarin, I learned it for uh, taking night classes for three years. Uh, about a total of three years and I, then I, I, I took a test, an official uh, test administered by the government of China in the United States. It's called the Hanyu Shiping Culture. The, and I passed it and that made me uh, uh, eligible for a foreign expert certificate of a particular kind. Uh, not just, I mean, you don't have to speak Chinese to to go to China, you're you're probably if you're going China because you need a girl, <laughs> you're probably better off not learning to speak Chinese. You know, you can be into Chinese culture a little bit. That's fine. But if you if you do like me and you you have to realize if you're if you really learn the Chinese language as best you can, which I which I did, and you go over there on a foreign expert certificate. 
it's going to mean that you're going to have to be involved with a lot of really more Chinese stuff than you may be wanting to handle. Um, whereas if it, guys that are trying to go over there to get married, because this, yeah, it's real easy. Uh, it could be, you know, a big pain in the neck, buddy. Yeah, but, <laughs> uh, um, if you don't speak any Chinese at all, then your partner is going to have to deal with the Chinese stuff. And you'll sort of get uh, exempted from it, which is probably, you're probably better off. Uh, uh, you're, you have to face if, if you do something like that. Well, the, the good for me, since I learned how to speak Chinese, I was able to travel and experience a lot on my own that, that uh, a lot of people would not have been able to do. Uh, But that came with uh, having to deal with uh, Tian Gao Huang Di Yuan. Heaven is high and the emperor is far away. Situations that cannot be helped, uh, as it were. Um, if you read some Chinese books, or like The Romance of the Three Kingdoms, or The Outlaws of the Marsh, uh, or uh, The Dream of Red Mansions, if you get good translations of them, uh, yeah, you can get some idea, really, of what Chinese culture is like, how complicated it is. Uh, all right. Got some more very tall books that have managed to get out. Bring some smaller ones down. And get the taller ones up, up, up. Wow, yeah, um, there's, uh, I, you know, I've been out of China. I can talk about China uh, of, uh, what, I, I, I arrived back in January of 2012 or something like that. So, yeah, it's been about 10, 11 years since I've been back. Um, so I can talk about the, the way it was then. And um, generally, uh, for, for me, um, yeah, I, w I was looking for a permanent, uh, I, 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 well, This is a great story. I should I shouldn't leave it out. Um, ooh, I had some books back then too, but I had bought a, a condominium, um, and um, I got involved when I was getting ready to go to China for the first time with a, a Mongolian uh, girl, Wang Zhongwen, and. Um, Yeah, it was it was a mistake, and I, you know, I, I, uh, yeah, she was ready to get married pretty quick. Uh, she sure was, and I should, you know, I should not have married her, but but I did, and um, yeah, when I when I went uh, to China, she didn't want to come. So I was like, well, we get a divorce then. She didn't want to get a divorce, you know. Um, well, yeah, she's like, I'm getting nothing out of this. <laughs> but that what what had happened is, uh, um, 
you know, she she married me under under false pretenses, and I was just uh, continuing on my you know my stated. I I I'm like that, you know. I I, I tell a I tell a girl, look, I'm not impressive. I'm not trying to impress you. This is what I'm doing, right? If you want to do it with me, we can get married, right? I'd like to stay with somebody forever and, you know, just just really develop a, a, some real last. I, I like long friendships and, and, and love and stuff like that. I, I want that. I want to weave a fabric of human civilization that's strong and so on. Um, but, you know, some, some people are like, well, once we're married, I'll just I'll just tighten the screws and, you know, he'll just have to do what I say. And no, yeah, uh, I don't. I don't have to do what anyone says. <laughs> do and and but at the same time, uh, I feel obligated to really stick to my guns and what my plans are. So when I married, when I married this Mongolian girl, uh, you know, she knew I was very clear that I was going to China. I would, you know, and she couldn't grasp, uh, I think, and there was no way for her to grasp how bad I felt about the Iraq war and sanctions and all the crappy stuff that uh, my country was doing in the world. Uh, just awful where I don't even want to participate in it anymore. And not only that, another factor is that they were saying, well, all the jobs are going to move overseas to China, so you better work hard, you know. So what am I, John Henry or something? You're going to move all the jobs to uh, to China anyway. Dang it. Right? I'm already working this hard. You know, a, a hyperactive person... It's just a hard, you know, it's going to work too much anyway. My sister Donna was like that. She worked too hard. Poor thing. Ah. Uh. How long, how far along am I? Wow. Good. Making something of the evening. We are. I've got to come up with a next step. Procedure. This is, I think, going to shape up really nicely. Let's see. We're going to 
find in square books. Oh boy. Really, really bad. have to believe in yourself. Believe that you can do it. Stick to your guns. Don't give up. Corduroy's Christmas surprise. Lying in the living room. Man, you shouldn't be lying anywhere. Get up. Don't be lying around. Not doing any work. Wow, I can't believe it is coming together. Kakuna Knight of the Blue Heart. I see something that goes here. This is beautiful. I, that's definitely staying out where we can look at that with the daughter tomorrow. Absolutely, without a doubt. Thanks for tuning in. Um, I am going to go ahead and stop the stream now. and I'm going to try to get back on. Um, well, actually, let, let's do an intermission. There's too much to be done.
test. Testing. All right. Yeah, coming back. Slowly but slowly. I've got, uh, okay, let me get my live scene back on. Uh, if you've watched some of these book streams, you, you, you'll, you'll know that, I, um, I've got a, uh, Easy Spanish Reader, second edition, a three-part text for beginning students. Contesta en oraciones completas. Oraciones? Is that oration? Vampire Academy. Oh, she looks like uh, she might bite somebody. Sometimes I think the thing I miss the most about dime novels is the part where they cost a dime. My sister's husband said, well, you know, back then, too, it was hard to get a dime. Dimes bought more. Was his point. He's absolutely right. Super Science Fair Projects, the handy homework helper. Everybody needs that. Made to crave, satisfying your deepest desires with God. New shoes, a decadent dessert, popularity, a date with that cute guy, and English. Every day is filled with things we want and crave, things that will make us feel good, at least for a moment. Well, what happens when that moment is gone and the need returns? She lost me. Uh -uh. What happens when you get a life? A lot of things. Amazing stuff. The Giving Tree by Shel Silverstein. And the very big, yeah, in the very first pages, that's been vandalized with markers beyond repair. The Bipolo Seed and Other Stories by Dr. Seuss. Wow, this looks great. Wow. Excellent condition. Pristine. What is this? Happy Feet, Mumble's Journey. The Lion King. Okay, that's one of the square ones. A Little Princess. Put that there. This here. What have we got? What could it be? The Caldecott Metal. Where the Wild Things Are by Maurice Sendak. Or story, yeah. Story and pictures. Harry Allard. Miss Nelson is missing. If all teachers looked as goof goofy as Miss Mr. Marshall makes these two, the Earth would never again have a truancy problem. Miss Nelson is missing. Hello, say hello to Zorro. The 
elf on the shelf. Elves. Elves and Jesus. It just fits. <laughs> Not! Uh, This is an amazing book. Story. 1799. Oh. Just needs to be cleaned up a little bit on the front. Looks like. Rubbing. Get it all nice and brand new again. Now, um, one of the things that I want to do on this course is um, training, right? All right. So that this guy, the I, I want you know in in certain circumstances to have this. How? Well, I need to set it up exactly like I, I want it to be, which I guess is like that. And then uh, turn it off and then go back to, to this guy. Now, um, This, this, um, now, uh, all right, so here, here's my new layout that I want to work with. All right, what do I do? All right, now, um, if you're, if you're, uh, what, what I, in order to show what I'm going to do, what needs to happen is I need to send my entire larger screen out um, so I can do a little bit of work in arranging how this stuff is Being handled. All right. So, uh, what what I need is I need a new source up at the very top, and I'm gonna make it uh, a screen share, a monitor, screen capture. So, um. I'm going to get my screen up here. Bear with me for a moment. There we go. All right, so uh, I, yeah, I, you may have been able to see this on my stream chat. I'm gonna clear this. Um, this King Killer is when we we, we do the Mecarina uh, gameplay stream. I, I'm doing it scheduled from 4:30 to 8:30 Eastern st uh, Standard Time in the morning. Um, this books uh, show is is more going to be tied into the training and you know I have to go back and forth what what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to integrate a lot of uh, different things 
um, uh, into one thing just to make it possible uh, to get everything done. So I'm refreshing my chat. Let's see. Do I even have to want more screen real estate? You can see here at the bottom, I added uh, a screen capture. And um, I guess if I want to be versatile, uh, I could go ahead. And I, I'm kind of going to push the envelope a little bit on this. I'm, I'm going to go ahead, watch what I'm doing. I'm going to add another screen capture. Click Add Source. Okay, and this is key. You you want to go add a new source, right? Screen Capture One, and now it's going. It's saying it's losing a lot of frames. All right, so what I can do, as you can see, I can, if you're watching the stream, I can turn that on or off. I can turn the screen capture off. Now, uh, I had brought some... Uh, light bulbs around to oh yeah I can see where they are um, let me get my lighting situation squared away hold on just one moment It's kind of hot.
All right. So, um, in the center window, well, what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to uh, I'm going to make some observations here. Uh, this center window down here. What, what I need to get is I need to get uh, the, the particular items selected that need to be on top. And they all have to be ex uh, selected at the same time in order for me to scale them. Now, these are the one you can see they're being selected sequentially. You can see their frames are being selected. Right now, now I have them all right. And what I can do is scale them down. So what I would like to do is just, I'm left mouse clicking and holding. You see how I'm dragging it all, all the way up. Now I'm going to use my arrow keys to try and get my screen capture right where I want it to be. So unresponsive. I'm just giving up.
2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. This is awful. Worst performance. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three. Did you ever read Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde? I figured out, you know, it's one of the, uh, my mom was trying to read it to me when I, when I was real, real small. And it was like I was six or something like that. And um, I was very interested in it. And I, what struck me was in the beginning when the, the first, you first encounter Mr. Hyde and he travels over a little girl, you know, when she's on the street, you know, playing runs over travels her down and I was so fat you know but Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde was such a popular uh, uh, theme at, at the in the early 19 or the middle 1960s when I was born that I got most of the story from cartoons and when you go back, and I did go back recently, and I'm working on, on reading it, you realize that uh, when th there was a time period when nobody knew uh, what the story was about Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, you know, it's like there were two people, and it, it's only after the story, you really get into the story that you find out that they're really the same person. And I had thought very early on it was a, a theme of uh, alcoholism, or drug abuse, drug drug addiction, and so forth. I, I had thought much much earlier in my life that it was uh, that's what it was really about. Um, how people change from alcoholism. A slow process where people just reach a point of no return. They're not really the same person they used to be anymore. You know. So I've got this big, huge bag on the table, and it's all lightweight. It's birthday party stuff and a toy. Let's go up. got a bunch of broken computers here so you can see I'm good at fixing them sort of and I've gone through I, I, I school was like throwing this stuff away because every time you start up these computers now they're like well it's not gonna run Windows 11 
Like, jeez, I don't want to know where it's going, so I can throw it away. I literally I dove into a dumpster to pull a lot of these out. So the thing is, is maybe I got about 80 computers. Well, maybe about 30 of them are uh, took something real. This is like maybe dropped out on a freeway or something like that. Really busticated. But um, I went through repairing them, and I, I'd like to make computer repair training. I did computer repair for Georgia State University from the the days of the PC. It's uh, it's really really fun. When we when I was first working in the computer department at Georgia State, yeah, we had full height. We had floppy drives that were this high. <laughs> what is it? Eight inches or something? Six inch? I forget how big they were. Six or eight inch? Six. Five and a half, five and a half inch floppies or something. <laughs> it's been a long time, <laughs> but <laughs> clean it up. Table. Just got a place to stack broken computers. <laughs> I like to get everything organized so we can work on one job uh, and not not be changing out all the time. Um, so when I get to a place where I can um, do computer repair stuff, I'll have all the computers all lined up and I'll just be able to go through them one by one and repair them. And I, I think uh, oh, this is also lightweight stuff. It should go up above. Oh my goodness, I don't, I don't know, this is something. Oh, look at this. Beautiful magnifying glass. Fascinating. Got just the place for it. I've got a, you know, it's one of those canisters that sits on your um, desktop and holds all the office stuff in it. These tape measures need to get to where tools stay. Stay with them. And I've got a, uh, let's see if I can get something going here. Well, no, I can't. Uh, this I guess as, as, as far as I've made it uh, uh, today, and, and we now I've got um, hmm. 
my scene more more set up in a way that I can train from. And really, I should have been in bed bed a long time ago. So I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn in and try to get back up at 4:30, 4 o'clock. And ooh, I messed up, man. I should not have stayed up so late. But yeah, it's a lot of work that needs to be done. So wish me luck, and I'll I'll try to be there in the morning for some good old Macarena. <laughs>